I am standing out in what appears to be the middle of nowhere Arizona, which as a matter of fact, it most certainly is. Although it might appear to be the middle of nowhere, just to the south that way, about five miles, is a town that rose up from ashes. That is the infamous town of Tombstone. I'm currently parked off Middle March Road, which is at the base of the foothills behind me of the Dragoon Mountains. This road takes you about six miles to the north here up to a place called China Camp, which was a mining camp that originated in 1913. The tales of this mountain range behind me are full of betrayal, injustice, and complex stories that you are not gonna wanna miss this weekend, so stay tuned. I began my ascent into the foothills of the Dragoon Mountains where I would take a left-hand turn on a Forest Service Road 697. The roads were rocky but decently maintained and at the top at 7,000 feet was where I was to find China Camp. As stated, China Camp, or which was originally called Borden Camp, was developed sometime after the Apaches had settled on reservations. It was rumored in 1849 that the Dragoon Mountains contained gold. Prospectors were sent up into the mountains to search for this gold, but were met with heavy Apache resistance. After the Apaches were pushed out, miners only found quartzite in the mountains. After their disappointment, they began to call the claims Old Terrible Mine. Superstition has it that after Geronimo found gold, or better yet, stole gold, he dispersed it all over the Chiricahua lands and partially in the Dragon Mountains. I had finally reached China Camp, but was a bit underwhelmed by just the remaining two slabs, so I decided I'd push on towards the mines. The mine I was interested in checking out had a road leading up to it that I had seen people call the switchbacks of death. So I decided to put the drone up for my own due diligence to check out these switchbacks. Well, apparently I underestimated this road. Uh, if I wasn't by myself this weekend, I may try that, but I am by myself and I don't wanna be stuck here for the weekend. So I'm gonna hoof it just for you. I'm going up to the top. Cause why let a stupid little washout like that ruin a cave exploration or better yet mining exploration. So. I'm gonna hike probably a mile to the top of this ridge. The drone made this road look a lot better than it is. And sometimes that's what it comes to is hiking. So I am unbelievably gassed walking up a maintain, well not maintain, but it's a road all right. 
And it just brings into question, how the hell did the Apaches do it? And then I start thinking, no wonder the Americans were so reluctant to chase them up into these hills. First of all, there was no road here. It would certainly be impassable by horse climbing these grades. And secondly, I don't know who in their right mind will want to march a thousand troops up into these hills with all these caverns and rocks and hideouts. It's no wonder the Apaches were so good <sighs> at evading Americans. Well, the mine's right there. I can see the flip car, but I just had to bushwhack down that with dog. And this is treacherous, clearly not a hiking trail. Well, here we are. It's an old Suburban, I think. Kind of looks like it. Ugh. Curious. I would assume the people of this Suburban met their fate. Because that's a long way down from the road. That's quite the, uh, probably 100, 150 feet I just walked down. But here's the mine. I realized hiking up here, there's more tailings. There's some over there, you probably can't see on the camera, that I could have driven to, but those didn't have a flip Suburban. So clearly I was more intrigued by this one. Oh yeah. That is a mine, hot damn. All right, we shall enter. Oh, it kind of stinks in here. I got my head handy dandy headlamp on. Wow. There's still the original, original tracks. Wow. Well, we have scat. Uh, I don't even know what that would be. GR15209. Numbers on the wall. Coming right back to more track. Regional planks. Pretty fascinating. The flies disappeared. See the original boring holes. Well, whoa, this might be the end here. Interesting. And we've made it back out unscathed. And there's dog. A bit anticlimactic, you could call that, but I have a soaring view of Tombstone right out there. And uh, it's a nice day, so not a total loss. Well, I am just returning back to the truck. Um, I was considering going up to that mine. I don't know if you can see the road. It's pretty steep. I could easily get up to it and check it out, but that insignificant hike up this mountain worked up quite the bolstering appetite for myself. So I think that dog and myself are going to go have lunch somewhere. And then I'm going to move over to a very significant spot. And from that point, we're going to move around into the north side of the mountain to a very unique location that I'm really excited to show you. Something you have to get used to on these Arizona backcountry mining roads is their lack of maintenance, which is something that makes them even more tempting to try. If you have a relationship with your clear coat, forget about it. And don't be the goofball to hold up the convoy to take out a few branches. my father has coined the term two slabs. 
I'm not entirely sure why, but these big walls and these two slabs might have something to do with it. I'm not particularly certain what the history is behind these walls, but this certainly is neat. There's a secondary wall back there. I'm sure at some point this was the foundation for the grounds of the mines because I see tailings all over these hills. Quite fascinating how a place that can be so rich with history can erect so quickly out of nothing and turn into a desolate piece of history. This spot has extreme significance to me and my family. This is the location my grandfather's ashes were spread where he lays eternally in these hills. I remember growing up and seeing pictures of Geronimo and entire bookshelves dedicated to the Apache tribe in his office. At that point in my life, I had little appreciation for the history of these rich lands. But my grandfather was so passionate about the history that after he died, he wanted his ashes spread somewhere here close to the stronghold, which is just on the other side of this mountain. To think that he is laying to rest next to the great tribal leader Cochise is something that sparked my fascination. The tribal history and their culture was incredibly fascinating, and that, most importantly, of the Shikonan tribe. My plan is to hang out here for a little bit, grab a bite to eat, have a snack, and then I'm going to move over to the north into Cochise Stronghold. The Chiricahua Apaches entered into the southwestern United States between 1400 and 1500, sometime after the Mogollon culture disappeared, which thrived in the Four Corner States from 200 AD to 1400 AD. This tribe is considered to be the same descendants of the Apaches, which reside in the closest reservation called the San Carlos Reservation, north of here almost 100 miles. Other similar tribes in the region were the Aravaipa, White Mountain, and Membrano Apaches. Well, there you have it, that's the stronghold. I'm backing out of here right now. I didn't quite make it to the campground. Um, God, that view is just, these rockscapes are just stunning, stunning. Um, I didn't make it to the campground. There is far too many people back here. I was uh, expecting not many. I didn't think this place would be all that popular, but it is Friday afternoon and it's a nice Friday afternoon, so. I'm gonna go back up this way, try to find a little spur trail campground I can get down on and uh, make some dinner.
I think I might have just scored the best campground out here. I'm not sure why all those people settle for the actual campground, but this is killer. I've got a beautiful view of all these rocks, even towards the stronghold that way. I have a view out towards the Chiricahuas, and all that is Pierce. And I have my own personal little fire pit. And this is just a little piece of paradise, that's for sure. There are many different Apache tribes around this area. The one I'm focusing on today is the Chiricahua Apache. There's the Membrano Apache, Aravipa Apache, and even the White Mountain Apaches came down this far. Each different tribe were within peace with one another. They shared trade and trade routes, and even were hospitable towards whites. They rarely endured conflict, but the real conflicts came when the white settlers moved down into these lands. And it's not to be mistaken that the Mexicans didn't push up this way either. Many years before the Mexican-American War, Apaches were raiding all over northern Mexico in Chihuahua and Sonora. Eventually, the governors of both states had enough of the Apache raids, and they pushed the Apaches back up out of Mexico into these lands where they called their home. With the conclusion of the Mexican-American War, in the U.S. victory in the Gadsden Purchase, many troops from the north were to move down and bring cavalry into these lands. This stunning rockscape behind me is a lot more than just rocks. It was the hideout for Chief Cochise and his Apaches, and what he considered to be his safe haven. Chief Cochise was the son-in-law of the greatest Apache leader, Mangus Coloradus. Mangus Coloradus and his tribe were just on the other side of the New Mexican border from here, in the Black Range. The Black Range is a place I recently visited and saw petroglyphs on the walls of Chloride Canyon. These rocks are full of legends and tales. It's said that you can still hear the tribal drums and the war cries of the Apaches when the wind picks up just right off of the canyon walls. In 1861, the Aravipa Apaches raided the farm of John Ward, stealing his son Felix and retreating back into the hills. Lieutenant George Bascom of the U.S. Cavalry was ordered to recover the child. This was the start to the Bascom Affair and the longest war in American history. It wasn't until the battle at Apache Pass before George Bascom knew he was at a disadvantage to the expert warriors of the Chiricahuas. Home sweet home. I have to say, the foot pack is single-handedly the greatest investment I ever made. This is seriously a home on wheels, and I'm considering if this YouTube thing takes off just to go live out of this thing. Maybe sell my house and just do this all the time. It would be amazing, and telling the stories of the state and other states. I love the history of it, and this thing is just giving me the accessibility to be comfortable and do it all. I mean, I can sit here and watch the sun go down from the view of my porch. This is easily camping at its finest. I gotta say guys, I'm really starting to enjoy this whole solo camping thing. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I guess it can be hard to figure out how to stay entertained the entire time, especially if you don't have service. So I'm curious, when you guys solo camp, what exactly do you like to do to keep yourself entertained? For myself, I like to play a little guitar. Try to not let my ADD get in the way of reading a book. And of course, I can't refuse the masculine urge to throw a couple rocks. I was just thinking about how incredibly fortunate I am to be able to come out and do these sort of things. I drive out here into these incredibly rural areas, desolate as all, all get up, and I pop open a small camper in the bed of my truck and I'm able to get out of the weather, I can sleep comfortably, I have heat. It's just something I think I take for granted too often. 
And being able to come out here and share the stories of our history is something I am even more fortunate for. I think a lot of this history gets lost, and I think a lot of this history is underappreciated. For more than 500 years, people have made the best out of this landscape. There's clearly resources, obviously deer, past a lot of running water coming in, and the San Pedro River was as full as I've ever seen it. So it's no wonder that people were able to live so long off this landscape. But thinking about people traveling across country to settle here in the hopes of mines and riches and that sort of thing is just something that baffles me. 200 years ago, I'm sure the people who came out to these lands never thought that someone would be sitting up on top of the hill talking about their stories and sharing their past <laughs> and camping out of the back of a truck. broke my pick and nail. Not for my nose, that's my thumb, but for my guitar. Like I said, it's dinner time. And I'm your typical lazy bum. So I got this stuff. Uh, it's Primal, True Primal. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but I want to shout this product out. I just, it's chili. It's pre-made chili. They're about six bucks a serving, which is substantially cheap all I got to do is throw this in a pot and heat it up which is really convenient um, and it's all grass-fed beef uh, everything is locally sourced whatever that means so my game plan gosh darn it for tomorrow is to uh, try to beat the sunrise um, slim chance of that I'm not an early riser but I'd like to get up and get some shots of these mountains getting hit by that sunrise I think that would be stunning and I just realized that I forgot eggs uh, for some reason it's pretty habitual that I forget eggs but what can I say don't smoke pot kids it'll fry your brain so I might go try to find somewhere uh, cute, as my wife would call it, to eat between here and Fort Bowie, and that's the location where I'm headed tomorrow morning. just emptied out the last remaining bit of my bladder onto the campfire. The wind's coming in pretty gnarly right now. Um, getting kind of tired of it. So I figure it's time to turn in for the night. The sun just went down. It's closing in on 7.30. So good time to lay down, hang out, listen to some podcasts and chill out and try to wake up early.
sometimes it just absolutely pays off to forget your breakfast there's nothing like these little small town diners i don't know what it is but oh it just gives me such a wholesome feeling every morning i i'm out here by myself she's excited to see me going into these little small town diners like this it's oh, i love it i don't know what it is about it but they give you huge portions cheap i paid 10 bucks for that all of that food that was crazy and had the sweetest little waitress so if you're down here near pierce or sunsides make sure you check out sandy's this place is rock solid i took the 181 east towards the chiricahuas and then split up north until eventually exiting on apache pass road and up into the dos cabezas wasn't erected until 1870, eight years after the fight here at Apache Pass between George Bascom and Cochise. This is the setting for the meeting between George Bascom and Cochise to discuss the return of John Ward's son, Felix. Felix would grow up to become a part of the Apache culture and eventually a scout for the US military. When the meeting took place, Bascom accused Cochise's tribe of capturing and detaining the child of John Ward. This was obviously denied. Cochise said, give him 10 days and he would have the child return from the Air Viper Apaches. Bascom had none of that. He tried to detain Cochise and keep him with, along with his family. Cochise said no. He took his knife, he cut his way out of the tent and escaped up into the mountains somewhere this way. Unfortunately, Bascom had held Cochise's family hostage as well as other tribal members. There was negotiation for returns of hostages on each side, but eventually tensions rose and that all fell through. A couple skirmishes happened here at the pass, where eventually Bascom would retreat back to Fort Buchanan. Fortunately, Cochise's family was spared, but four other Apache warriors were killed, including his brother. The following year in 1862, one year after the meeting between Cochise and Bascom, the great Apache leaders Cochise, Mangus Coloradus, and Geronimo put together a string of 200 Apache warriors and raided this fort in 1862. Being it was the year of 1862, this meant the Civil War was just kicking off. Union and Confederate soldiers were fighting for the lands of the Arizona Territory. It should also be noted that this spot in Apache Pass was a location of the Butterfield Overland Route. Union troops took great losses as well as the Apaches, but were able to fight the Apaches off using artillery. The Apaches first targeted the artillery and began their raid but were eventually pushed back when men re-manned the cannons and fought them off. This location was extremely important to both the cavalry as well as the Apaches because Apache Springs is just located down the canyon that way. It was a life source for the area and always contested. Many battles were fought throughout this area over the next 20 years. From here to the Chiricahuas, down to the Sierra Madres in Mexico, and all the way to the Dragoons in Texas Canyon where I was yesterday. The F Company of the U.S. Cavalry thought that they could outman and outgun Cochise throughout Texas Canyon. Sure enough, when they got to Texas Canyon, he was nowhere to be found, but the great leader Geronimo was. Geronimo and his Apaches took out each cavalry member one by one and sent them retreating back to Fort Bowie. Although the Apache were great warriors, they knew their days were numbered. They did not want to give up their land and they would not give up their land, and that meant they would die for it. A battle near Fort Grant or back in the time was Camp Grant near Bonita, involved Papago scouts and U.S. cavalry, as well as a militia of townspeople. They were tired of the Apaches, and these were the Aravipa Apaches specifically. When the men were out on a hunting trip, the Papago and the soldiers infiltrated their camp and murdered over 140 children and women in a short period of time. General George Crook, or better known as Chief Wolf, deemed by the Apache warriors, was tasked to bring peace between the Apaches and the U.S. He tracked Cochise down into New Mexico at the Sierra Madres, where eventually he would talk him into settling at the San Carlos Reservation, about 100 miles north of here. This reservation was known as Living Hell, or Hell on 40 Acres. The Apaches resented this place, and due to poor American policy at the time, 
and lack of understanding. The U.S. government thought that every Apache and every different tribe in this area had some sort of relation with one another, which was not the case at all. General George Crook knew the task to bring in the Apache leader would be near impossible. His troops were men of machinery. He had trained them, scouted with them, and built them into the machines and war machines they were. Although Crook had a rough reputation, he gave integrity towards the situation and wanted peace with the tribes. He stated that his men were built like machines, as I said, but the Apaches were individual warriors, something that could not be competed with because they knew these lands and had spiritual value in these lands. Although seemingly an impossible task, George Crook was able to convince Cochise that he would move to the San Carlos Reservation. After escaping several times, along with Geronimo, it was settled that they would return here and live out the rest of their life. It's not to be said that some of the Apaches didn't remain at San Carlos, which has grown into a massive reservation to this day, along with the White Mountain Apache tribe. Cochise would be able to remain on his native lands. He would return to the stronghold, which I was camped at yesterday, and live out the rest of his life in paradise, as he stated. In 1874, almost 10 years after the battle here, and many other battles that would follow, Chief Cochise would die of stomach cancer. His body was to be taken back to the stronghold. I'm not exactly sure where he died, but I know he was laid to rest somewhere between the jagged rocks of Cochise stronghold, and that's how it got its name. It is said that anywhere between 100 to 200 people died here at this fort, and somewhere between 50 to 100 people died in the Dragoon Pass. The structure I'm standing in now, or what used to be a structure, is the location where Geronimo, Mangus Coloradus, and Cochise would meet. They would meet with the leaders of this fort and U.S. military and talk peace time and time again. It took 10 years to settle on the decision, and nearing the 1890s is when all the battles finally stopped. It took a great deal of effort and should be regarded as the longest war in American history. It was an honor to bring you this content. I love this history more than anything. This is some stuff that just absolutely fascinates me. And If you all like this as much as I do, I sure hope it takes off because it gives me an excuse to dive deeper into these historical stories that I think are underappreciated. So if you all enjoyed this, please don't forget to give me a subscribe and a like, and, and I'll bring you some more stories very soon. Let me know, give me some feedback if you like this or not, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, YouTube.